pop culture. Our classic pop culture theme song by Joe Mandica, Australia's gift to the world of pop music. Thank you, Joe, for writing, producing, and performing our classic pop culture theme song. And how you doing, everybody? This is your pal and fellow fan of pop culture, Steve Ludwig, welcoming you to another edition of Steve Ludwig's Classic Pop Culture, right here at planetludwig.com. Congratulations. We have all landed safely and peacefully once again at Planet Ludwig. And here we are, show number 161, and our guest is musician... Mr. Steve Rubin. Steve is probably best known for his work in the field of jazz, but he certainly doesn't limit his musical output exclusively to jazz, as you'll hear during our conversation coming right up. To lead us into that conversation with Steve, get ready for some music by Steve Rubin and the rest of the band that is beyond jazz a touch of psychedelia a touch of jazz some tasty spacey vibes coming your way right now and then our interview with Steve Rubin Thank you. 
Steve Rubin taking us beyond jazz with the brilliant, trippy, spacey number we just heard. A perfect way to begin a show on Planet Ludwig, I might add. Our guest Steve Rubin has been drumming for over 40 years, but jazz is not his only style. Classic R&B, soul, disco, funk, blues, rock, fusion, electronica, they all fit into Steve's musical circle. The New York Hudson Valley Jazz Festival, produced by Steve, returns this August 12th through the 15th, and you can go to HudsonValleyJazzFest.org and learn all about it, and get yourself to the fest that the New York Times described as running the gamut from mainstream jazz to performances that push the music's boundaries into territory that have not yet been explored. Let's see how far we can push Mr. Rubin's boundaries as we welcome to classic pop culture the magnificent musician, Mr. Steve Rubin. Steve, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I don't, I don't know if I call myself magnificent, but I appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the promotion. Okay, so I will add an adjective, the humble magnificent musician, Steve <laughs> Rubin, okay. because you do magnificently, Steve. I, I love your music and the, the stuff you've sent me. We're going to share with, uh, with our listeners. Um, you know, before we even get going, what can you tell us about the, uh, the number we just heard? Well, myself and three to five or six other musicians get together a few times a month, could be two, could be three or four times a month, and we have what we call an improvisation workshop. That is to say that we're not playing rehearsed tunes or reading from any prearranged music. We're just letting things happen as they were. Um, in some musical cultures, they might call that jamming. Other mm-hmm. might call that free, open playing. I think they're all similar in nature. I don't think it so much matters, the term. But what we do is um, we just play and we'll, we'll record it and we'll listen back and we might put in two or three hours and we might find that there's half an hour of stuff that we don't think works and another half hour, an hour that we think sounds okay. And then the, maybe another half an hour or so that we go, wow, that came out better than we thought. So mm-hmm. we just allow ourselves to enjoy the moment. It's in a, it's a workshop in listening. And that's the key component in any style of music that you play. Yeah. You know, it's uh, what you describing that, um, reminds me or I see a parallel on in the past I've had authors on the show as well uh, novels and things like that and they say sometimes when they have a specific um, story in mind suddenly the story overtakes them and it just writes itself the story many times it sounds a little bit like what what uh, what you guys go through with with what what you just described. I mean, it's got to be a very cool feeling saying, wow, where are we going? Where is this taking us? But you just go with it. Is that a fair? Right. Well, that's, yes, I'm sorry. Well, that's what draws us to do this is the idea of um, we're surprised. We don't know what's, where this is all going to lead. And we just let things unfold as they were. And uh, we don't have any... Um, expectations in terms of what we think is going to come out. And so that's a kind of a good way to approach it because that way you're not disappointed um, and you're not setting yourself up for um, any surprise. Yeah, <laughs> in right. a way. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's got to be, um, I mean, if I, Steve, I play no musical instruments, but music is such a big part of my life. But if I were to play, I think I would, I would, I would, that would be my favorite way of playing, uh, like okay, great. jamming or, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, umbrella you want to put it under. Do you prefer um, structured, doing structured work or are you more apt to like what we just heard? Or is that an like, unf- or is that an unfair question? <laughs> okay, well, it, no, it's 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 uh, what I would say a question that often is asked of people who play music. I like to think of music a little bit like 
anything that you have a taste for. Let's let's, let's think about going to an event where there is a buffet, and you look over at the buffet, and at that moment you think, wow, look at all that great Mexican food. Then you walk a few steps down, and you go like, wow, there's some really good Italian food too. Mm-hmm. There's Indian food. So I think we all um, have had experiences where we've had um, – quite a melange of different choices on our plate and then there are times when you just eat one style um i think it's it's it depends um there are times when i absolutely love playing tunes they could be rock tunes or funk tunes or disco tunes or straight ahead jazz tunes um and then there are times when i like to play and back up a vocalist and uh, and do traditional um, what we call uh, songbook material or standards. Right. And and then there's improvising. I, I think it all it's all in the mix. It's all fun to mm-hmm. do. Um, we do this um, on a regular basis as players because generally you'll find when it comes to playing music where you're just improvising, there are less opportunities to be present that in clubs or restaurants and cafes um i can see that yeah uh, and so this is kind of like our workshop but it's not as if any of the players involved only do one thing generally um a lot of musicians uh these days especially have a varied background in their in their in their taste yeah as as do you obviously from your um from your bio that I had read. Um, I guess this next question might need a little fine-tuning, but um, sure. at, at what point in your life, Steve, and I don't even know if this is accurate now, but did you say jazz is my main thing? Did you actually come to a point in your life when you said jazz is it for me? No, because no. It's, it's actually, it's, uh, it's almost not. It's like everything is it. Well, here's what happened. Um, when I was... Um, in my teens, I grew up, um, I'm obviously, um, from my age, I'm, I'm a function of the 60s and the Beatles on television and being influenced by that and coming into music through through rock and roll and As am I, learning to play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I still have great affection for all that music. But one of the things um, that I was fortunate to experience was to make friends with other musicians who had um, varied backgrounds, maybe more varied than my own, who, as we like to say, hipped me to other things, whether it was soul music or classical music or jazz. And a good friend of mine um, turned me on to listening to jazz. And when it occurred to me after working in a disco show band for a while that I would like to do some formal studying, I selected um, a big band jazz drummer, uh, Mel Lewis from the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra, mm-hmm. to, to study with so that I, someone could bring me into uh, a world that I didn't have a lot of familiarity with, and I could learn um, music that way. And I then studied with another big band jazz uh, drummer teacher named Sonny Igo, who um, also had just a jazz background. That didn't mean that I that I threw away Exiles on Main Street or the Beatles White oh, Album right. or um, <laughs> nice or hear. or Jimmy Cliff the Harder They Come or or James Brown. All those stuff is still in the rotation. It just meant like let me learn this as well. Um, when I moved to the Hudson Valley uh, fifteen and a half years ago, I met a lot of local musicians and they were all great players and. Uh, many of them were jazz players, and it just happened to have occurred to me at the time, after being at a local party, like we should have a local series, like maybe for a day we should have a, a one-day jazz festival with all these musicians celebrating the music. And of course, over time, I de- developed a great appreciation and affection for the music, because it's, it's our original American music. Yeah, And mm-hmm. um, I think that music of jazz has um, artistry and players and um, work done by people who who um, deserve high honor and recognition. Um, and um, I thought, well, let me um, 
that you get involved with it here locally and promote it. And I, I started a little little festival, and it was important to me to celebrate the music, and it was important to me to call attention to the fact that there are uh, local musicians that play at a really high level. Mm, that's 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 so great that you would do that. And as our um, listeners can see on, on on screen here, we have the uh, the site is Hudson Valley Jazz Fest dot org. Um, how many years has this been going? Well, it's been going 11 years. We managed to even do it last year during the pandemic. Yeah. We held some oh, shows outside. Um, it started out the first two years as the Warwick Valley Jazz Festival, and I changed it to the Hudson Valley Jazz Festival in 2012 in order to include other areas. Uh, the, the whole thing is it was really important all along to um, continue to um, uh Bring attention to the music, bring attention to the musicians. I think in any art form, um, uh, we're all, um, I should, I don't know want to say the word guilty, but I'll use it just because I can't In a think positive of way, term. how about that? Yeah. Of, of thinking that um, recognition, uh, acknowledgement of talent is only uh, placed upon those names that we're familiar with. You know, we. We go to movies and we know Meryl Streep and Robert De Niro, et cetera. And we go to concerts and we, we know the, the names that we know and, and styles of music we like. But as it turns out, um, as in whether it's theater or, or jazz or, or fine art or dance, it could be anything. There are people who, who have dedicated a lot of their lives to doing things and they, they do their work at a really, um, high level that, that folks, enjoy every bit as good as the names yeah. quote unquote and, and and if they're not as good uh, they're certainly uh, good enough for for folks to um to get something out of it it's mm -hmm. worth calling attention to them and that's that's the you know the central uh, theme got to it but to your question is how i personally stayed attached to jazz it's just that the jazz is sort of like a little maze when you you, you you decide you're going to listen to one artist and that leads you to somebody else, which leads you to a different period of time. There's an historical journey as well as a, um, a, a musician discovery journey. Uh, this per Jazz always has an intermix of, uh, of players who work with different people and different ensembles at different times and produce variations on similar things, whether it's Afro-Cuban jazz or African style or funk or fusion. And all of these flavors or styles of the music bring different players into the mix, which bring you somewhere else. Uh, I think back to when I lived in Manhattan when I go to Tower Records and I loved oh, gosh. sifting through, <laughs> yeah, I loved sifting through the albums because you pick up an album cover and you'd look and say, oh, wow, there's a new album by... Um, uh, whoever it is, and mm -hmm. you look in the back and say, oh, wow, look who's on drums. Look who's on saxophone. That's interesting. And this is interesting. Wow, look who's on um, uh, who's on trumpet. That's an interesting mix. I think I'll buy that because with right. that combination yeah. of players, how could I lose? You know, so there's all this discovery and that then you discover that the player that's on the record also did another style of music and it leads you there. And so it's this this ongoing road of leading you through the history of the music and, and the personnel and what they've done and what they've brought to the table. Yeah. Steve, do you remember <clears throat> this rhetorical question? I was, <laughs> but there was a, a, a club in the village called The Bottom Line. Yes, very well. Oh, and, and for those who lived in the area, I think they'll, they'll definitely relate to this as well. But remember, right down the street was the Big Tower Records and if if I if my wife and I or friends had tickets to the bottom line, we'd go get our seat. But I'd say a good th third of the audience came in with towel record bags. You know, that's always seemed to be the first stop before you go to the bottom line. Get there a little early, park, go to towel records, then go go to see the show at at bottom line. The record stores are so missed. I know there are you know there are vitals making the comeback, but. I'm kind of getting off the subject, but oh yeah, don't you miss no record stores? Yeah, bottom line, I was there many times. It was a it was a wonderful club. Oh gosh, yeah, you know, great shows there. I mean, there, you know, we still have the Blue Note, we still have the Village Vanguard. You know, for every place that leaves, there may be another one that comes back. Mm -hmm. And um, there's also um, look, that's why I'm talking about the Hudson Valley. There's there's a, a vibrant scene here. I mean, the past year, uh, as with any. Um, 
business or anything in the arts it's taken hit but um, you know you look under and around you go to Newburgh and, uh, and Woodstock and New Paul's and Warwick and Greenwood Lake and different spots and you, you're going to see you and find, hear, yeah. and you're going to discover that there are musicians and there are people uh, creating uh, performances and bars and cafes and clubs and we have the Falcon up in Marlboro and we got this tremendous theater down the road from uh, where I am called the Sugarloaf Performing Arts Center, which I hope and it seems like it'll get going again. We have an on the lawn concert series presented by folks in Sugarloaf that do a tremendous job. The Village of Warwick presents concerts outside. Green Lake presents concerts outside. There's Chester does that. So there's, there's, there's lots of places to, to find music and in, in, in that music, if, there's lots of opportunities to uh, to hear jazz. Yeah. Now, with with the Hudson Valley Jazz Fest, how does it work? Is it one stage and one act goes on, another comes off, or is it no? Yeah. It, it, the way um, it's designed is the Hudson Valley Jazz Festival is a collective of sponsors and um, venues. You, we could have, and it changes from year to year with, with, with a, you know, a fair amount of consistency. You can have a show in a coffee shop, library, art gallery, community center. We've had them in the Performing Arts Center in Sugarloaf. We've had them in, a, in parks in Pine Island, on the lawn here in Warwick, on the lawn in Sugarloaf. We've had them in, um, Warwick Historical Society owns some buildings. We'll have it there. Uh, we've had it in the Warwick Valley Community Center. So the idea is that we create multiple environments. We don't create the environment. We create multiple shows that take place in different environments. So if you'd rather sit outside on an afternoon, we've got a show for you there. That's if fantastic. You prefer, yeah. If you prefer something more formal in a theater, we'll generally have a show for you there. If you like being in a restaurant and being social with people and drinking and having a good time with a, you know, bringing a group of people and having dinner and also hearing jazz. Well, we have, we have quite a few of those opportunities. That is so, super, super. Uh, we discover places that would be ideal for it. We, we look for sponsors to help us um, create these concerts. And then we put together a schedule based on location and the artists involved so that the program could be as varied as possible. We're not, we, we haven't done a perfect job of that, but we always, uh, <laughs> we're always trying to get the closer to the goal. You mean you're not perfect, Steve? <laughs> well, <laughs> far from it. Yeah. <laughs> join the club. <laughs> yeah. Now was music played a lot in your house as a kid, Steve? Um, not so much. I mean, as it turned out, um, my mother did a little bit of singing when she was younger, but there really wasn't a lot of it. I have to say that it all was uh, kind of a cultural influx, you know, it was the times we lived in, you know, when after the Beatles hit on Ed Sullivan and my brother, who's three years older, started uh, listening to r records and rock and roll before I did. Um, and then your friend did it just it all sort of developed from that. I just uh, and it was in, um, I think the times that I lived in and the people that I met in my life uh, brought me uh, to mm -hmm. my enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I always like to say, and it's true, I, I'm not by any means a great musician, but I am, um, I'm a great enthusiast of the of the music of jazz i'm a, I'm a fan mm -hmm. and um uh, i have great affection f for music in general and for being involved with it um there are really are a lot of great players all around uh, the country whose names we don't know and there are a lot of them here in the area where i live i i don't count myself as one of them but i've had the good fortune of being able to work with quite a few of them and to um go to hear the work that they produce. And I think um, if you have the right attitude about the art that you're involved with, that'll take you uh, along pretty far. And just by staying involved and uh, supporting fellow artists and so forth, I think uh, that makes a difference. 
what what steered you toward the drums? Well, that's an interesting story. There, there's something quite specific. I have a memory that's absolutely clear of being a little kid. I don't know. Maybe I'm nine, 10, 11 years old. I'm not sure. I could probably figure it out, but it was a cousin's wedding. And I was standing, staring at the drummer. I could still visualize it to this day, watching him play with brushes and looking at his feet on the pedals. And it was like, it just drew me in. I thought it was whatever it was. I probably didn't think the word cool in my head when I was 10, but whatever, whatever you think (laughs) it was something there. years old in 1964, 1962, who knows what year it was, Mm -hmm. whatever you, whatever thought process you're capable of at that point in your life, it was equivalent to what I guess what a kid today would say like, wow, man, that's cool. And I was Mm -hmm. drawn to it. And every time, uh, Gene Cooper, a buddy Rich was on television. I was drawn to it. I remember Sammy Davis Jr. playing drums on a variety show. And I just had this great attachment and fascination. And, um, uh, I remember shortly after the Beatles came out, there was a group that Dave Clark Five led by a drummer and, and he had a nice shiny set of drums. And that really, that really, um, th- th- caught my eye. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's it's never easy to put into language like why people have attachment or fascination for something. It's and I'm, I'm not so sure that it's um, um it's easy that to it's useful yeah. because well, yeah. you, you, the magic is that you're there and you get drawn to it, and yeah. that's enough of an experience. I well, as I mean, it has drummers have always amazed me, Steve, and I'm I'm you're the perfect person to ask this. I mean, do you even think? As you're drumming, like, you know, with your feet moving, your hands. I mean, I would, I don't see how you keep the beat. (laughs) I know this sounds like such (laughs) a a layman's question, but is it just natural? Sure. So the same thing applies to any instrument. I think any, well, any skill, really. I mean, if you, 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 at some point in your development, whether you're learning to hit a ball or you're learning to um, play an instrument or, or to paint, you, you might learn um, a certain set of uh, skills and tools. Um, you know, obviously, some people are um, have some natural abilities that um, carry them further than other people. Some people have um, the beginning of those things and a little bit of knowledge that takes them further. And at a certain point in a performance as a musician, your brain is on because it has to be with, you might be reading music and you have to focus on that or you're, or you're paying attention to structure and form. Uh, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing someone else. Um, um, the guitarist, John McLaughlin talks about mm. that in terms of, uh, you get to this place where you have these, you develop these tools and this knowledge that maybe you've studied or worked on and both. And, while you're doing the work of making music, playing your instrument, these things kind of blend together in a non-conscious kind of way. Um, You're not thinking at every moment like, well, now I have to do this in order to do this. Yeah, right. That's what I would think. (laughs) Well, for some of us, um, and I would be one of those people, if your brain gets turned on for too long in terms of being self-conscious of everything you're doing, it um, it could ruin things <laughs> also, <laughs> mm-hmm. and I think your knowledge, whether you, your your your, um, your scope of what you've learned in your life through study and through experience, all gets hooked into the mix of who you are as a player, and it it is available for you to use in ways that um, I don't know that. Um, I mean, I'm talking about it because we're talking about it, but yeah. in ways you don't really uh, have to talk about because right. it it exists through the, the final product. You go like, "Wow, that's beautiful! What that uh, what that person just played on the violin." Right? The, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. It's it's a feel. I, I would assume it's it's a feel kind it, of thing. It's, it's everything. It's a yeah. feel. It's knowledge. It's skill. It's technique. It's it's natural. It's studied. It's it's, it's all those components, and and for different musicians it there might be a different 
uh, mix. I mean, there are people who um, who can access a set of skills and uh, inspiration uh, uh, more efficiently and with a with a greater reservoir of ideas than uh, than some other people. Mm-hmm. And there's some people who develop um, physical gifts on their instruments uh, that are more developed than others, and so forth. It's you know, there's a lot of a lot at play there. You know. Yeah. Do you? Um... Can you put into words what, for you anyway, distinguishes one drum set from another? What makes one better than another? Oh, no. And yeah. you know, most musicians don't really yeah, spend it's... time chatting about that. Mm-hmm. As it turns out, that's that's the kind of... that The only people who really talk about that are the people selling the product. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, um, it's a subjective thing. You know, it's sort of like... You know, it's like buying furniture for your living room. I mean, uh, except your this is involving sound. I mean, there are characteristics to different manufacturers' uh, drums, and by virtue of sizes of them, mm-hmm. that certain drummers will use for certain styles of music. But ultimately, um, it's not. It's way down the list of things to yeah. think about. Even though all of us think about it, because it's fun to think about it. Right. Drums, and equipment. You know, it, it, it. You know, it's the same thing. A, a really good musician will make music out of even um, a lesser quality instrument yeah. within limits. Obviously, mm-hmm. a piano has to be in tune. Obviously, yeah. the drum set parts have to function. I mean, you know, aside from the extremes. Um, it's not really, um, it's not that important, I guess. Yeah, you know, it's, it, things. it's so funny you said that, Steve, because I recently had the pleasure of interviewing John Cowsill of uh, the mm-hmm. Cowsills from the 60s, and he's been drumming with the Beach Boys for over 20 years. Or he's been with the Beach Boys, he's been drumming with them for about fif- uh, 15 years. He played the piano before that. But I asked him basically the same question. He said, you know, I saw Ringo on Ed Sullivan. He had Ludwig drums, so I said, I want to have Ludwig drums. And he said, I'm not technical. He said, I just, I know they look good, they feel good. A friend of mine, he said, might say, you know, you might not want to get this set because of this. He said, but I just, he he said, he just, it feels good and it looks good and that's good enough for him. So it's so funny you said that because that's basically what, what what he felt the same way. I mean, it's 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 a fun thing. I'm, I'm not going to say to you that uh, musicians and drummers that we don't also spend time looking at magazines and oogling over parts and fittings right. and drums, mm-hmm. of course. But in in the in the in this as pertains to um, being a good player, you, you know, you know, the world's greatest drum set is not going to create the world's greatest music. It, it still's got you know. You still have to have the person, <laughs> that, yeah. you know, saying something. Excellent that, point. Good point. Know. Yep. Sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, Steve. How about uh, this? Might be a nice time. Why don't we check out um, a video that you that you shared with us? Uh, okay. The Hudson Valley Jazz Ensemble. Um, oh, great. Yeah. This way, our audience can you know check you out and some of your fellow musicians before we look at it. Um, can you remember what's? Can you give a brief background to the performance? Um, I yeah, think, yeah, sure. That's um, a restaurant that's no longer here in, in Warwick. It was called uh, the Dowtaj, and that was a spot that uh, for a few years there was having jazz, um, if not every week, um, almost every week. And um, there were a rotation of musicians that played there, and um, uh, my being here, I got a opportunity to play there several times and i you know a few times a year and i i don't remember exactly who's on this side there's several players on there i know i think yeah, it's um I, you know I, my, as a matter of fact steve what's good is um they the they names list, are yeah. listed yes. yeah so that's yeah that's yeah this is so um this was this could have been um it could have been my 60th birthday party i'm not sure it mm-hmm. could have been just um a holiday event i used to do shows like that there and um um, uh, my, my friend and trumpet player, Rick Savage, uh, recorded it and, uh, everybody was there, you know, my wife and some other friends and some other family members. And, you know, every time I did a, a gig like that over there, I, I'd invite other musicians to come by and sit in. And, uh, my friend, Gabrielle Tranquina, uh, singing and her husband, uh, Joe Tranquina on keyboards. And, uh, we would do, uh, 
you know, a variety of material. Uh, um, which cut are you, are you playing? Are you, does it uh, uh, St. Thomas? Oh yeah, St. Thomas. Yeah, that's a tune I always love playing. Um, I think uh, I forget who wrote it. I think it might be the saxophone player Sonny Rollins. But I always liked playing that. Um, I thought it was a good uh, tune for uh, for party because it has like a, a festive feel to it. Mm-hmm. So um, 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 I, even though I put together the band, I wouldn't necessarily decide on every tune we played. But there were, there was you know there was always one or two I might say like oh I want to make sure we we do St. Yeah. St. Few, Thomas two definites so we yeah did, you know? well. How about we check it out right now, everybody, with uh, the Hudson Valley Jazz, uh, Hudson Valley Jazz Ensemble, our guest Steve Rubin and friends.
Swinging in Warwick, we just kind of put on there a nice tasty nugget from, yep. uh, now that was in a different that location. Was, well, that was the same spot, the Dow Ties, but that was with a small group I different, was playing with. Okay. And that was a good example of the spirit of jazz because uh, the saxophone player's name is Todd Williams. And Todd lived uh, briefly uh, over the mountain in Greenwood Lake, and Todd was a, was a tremendous player. I think he's a, a teacher out uh, west in a college and uh, uh, running a music program, a jazz program. But he was there, and he um, he he did what we like to call, you know, in the music world, sat in, which is to mm-hmm. say, a musician is is not necessarily on the entire gig, but is in the audience, and uh, he or she has their instrument, and they 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 come and they and they play a tune. And very cool, yeah. And uh, it was really thrilling. He's uh, uh, as anyone could hear, what a tremendous player. And, of course, um, you know, anytime you bring another player into the mix, you know, it's like mixing in, in a new ingredient to the stew, you know, and a player of that caliber, you know, brings up the level of the of the whole performance because it's um, contagious. It affects the the spirit of, of what we're all doing. And, yeah. and, and it, it, it bring, it's, it's a good example how an individual – Influences the collective, and the collective responds in kind, and just all together. Yeah, hey, let's uh, let, let's be cool to our guest, you know, or, or whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was thinking artistically, in that mm-hmm. you have the opportunity to experience um, what it's like uh, when people work together, which is one of the things I love about making music. It's always a, been for me an example of like what it what the potential is for folks when you have people who are working towards a common goal um, where um, the final product as um, is the result of the efforts of individuals and it's individuals focused on the group that make Mm -hmm. the final product what it is. And at the same time, everybody shines because everybody, everybody rises up when the final product is as good as that, you know. Yeah. So anyway, that was a, that was a great moment, and I, I remember it very well. And you know, w- watching that video, um, the, the second one we saw, swinging in Warwick, um, aesthetically, it, it it brings to mind for me. See, I love, I love a darkened club. No oh, sure. When I see music, you know, even a restaurant. I mean, my wife Sue. Whenever we, you know, whenever we go out to eat. Oh, I hope it's. I hope the lights are low. You know, it's just yeah, sure. it just adds to it, and you feel the same way, huh? Oh yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that. The other day we were doing a little, uh, having our Beyond Jazz session, and I was uh, preoccupied with uh, the fact that the um, the lights were on too bright, and that's because um, another part of my life, I, I used to do um, residential lighting consultation, so I have a. a, a more, I always think about lighting all the you know and you know and it's sort of when it lands inside my my music life as well it's kind of funny so i was i was preoccupied kind of bugging the other musicians to <laughs> lower the lights yeah yeah while they were while they were busy setting up like, mm-hmm. you know? so yes the you know environment hey man environment yeah. is uh it counts you know but you it was to create the, a mood the look of the video was perfect that's the, the point i wanted to make oh cool so steve in a non-pandemic year even though you know you like you said you know you played gigs last year and all or throughout the past year, but in a non-pandemic year, how many gigs do you normally average per year? Oh, I don't know. It varies. I don't. You know, I'd be honest with you. I am not like. Uh, I am not a heavy-duty, full-time working musician. I mean, I'm in, I'm involved in music, and I put a lot of time into the festival and other things happening in my life. Um, so that's a hard question. 
you know, t- uh, to answer. It, it, it goes through different changes. Mm-hmm. You know, I could be busy and then I could have dry periods. Um, yeah, and, it's hard know. to answer. It's an unfair question, actually, now that I yeah. think of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's all right. It's, 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 a, it's a curious matter. I mean, I'm not, I have not spent, it wouldn't be accurate to say that I spent my life, you know, touring the world or anything like that. I haven't, mm-hmm. you know, um, I've done lots of different things in my life and music is uh, a essential theme that's always been there, yeah. you know, uh, you know, is of, you know, premier importance and defines who I am in so many ways, though not necessarily entirely, but, um, you know, the important thing this yeah. year is to focus on seeing uh, how folks um, work together towards getting us uh, past this crisis we're in and uh, support venues that uh, present live music and uh, get to a place where people are comfortable uh, not only performing there, but people are comfortable um, going to shows in these environments and improve that. I mean, they're... Even uh, I know I, I know the people that own the Village Vanguard in Manhattan. And, you know, I think about what a tremendous um, hit and, and challenge they've had mm-hmm. uh, having live yeah. performances for so long. I, 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 I don't know exactly what they're doing right now. I, I, I'm not sure. I know they were doing some streaming, and um, uh, we we want to see these places survive. Um, the uh, there were several places around the country and places in New York and places up here as well that that uh, that shut down. Uh, and so yeah. mm. it's it's a real typical thing. I know a place up um, near Woodstock, um, a cafe, that uh, had a show scheduled this weekend and they just posted on social media they had to cancel it because the co-owner came down with, uh, oh, with COVID. Oh, so in so much as... Some folks might feel like, well, you know, things are great and it's not that bad. Well, you know, it, it's still happening. It's still a concern. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think a lot of people are thinking, OK, we're over the hump, blah, blah, blah. My wife is a nurse, Steve, so I can assure oh, those, so you who, get it, right? those who have <laughs> questions, it, we're not done. It's not over. You know, I mean, we're correct. getting there. We're doing the right things, but just we can't get cocky is the thing. No, absolutely not. And that was a good example because here was a here was a. Uh, I have some musician folks that I know who are there. In fact, I was thinking maybe even taking a ride up there uh, to this place. And uh, and you know here it is um, now. Uh, the show is postponed for this weekend. Um, there are other places that are keeping it going. I know the uh, Falcon up in Marlboro here in Hudson Valley has been finding a way to get um, shows going, and um, the. Uh, the On the Lawn concert series and Sugarloaf is going ahead with their series here locally. Mm-hmm. And um, we have uh, a local concert series here in Warwick. I, I think that that was put off for the season. Um, yeah. And so that, you know, that's that's going to be a disappointment to folks. Yeah, but, uh, you know, yeah. we have to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, so we should all stay focused on supporting venues that hire live music. And, um, absolutely. Yeah. In, in shop, you know, it's all, you know, shop local. I mean, you know, you know, Lincoln Center is a wonderful place, but, you know, your, your backyard has uh, yep. some pretty mm-hmm. amazing spots mm-hmm. also. Now, I was fortunate, very fortunate to have as a guest on actually show number 158, your wife, actress Bettina Sky. Oh, yeah. The, the one and only. Yeah, the one and only <laughs> Bettina Sky. Um, how did you guys meet, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, sure. We met in uh, 1990. Um, actually, met her because she was doing some freelance work as a party entertainer, mm-hmm. and um, I was in one of my uh, typical phases of my life, which is <laughs> seems to repeat itself more than it doesn't uh, of, ne- of needing money. And, um, and oh, um, you're, oh, you're in those phases too. Okay. Yeah, I don't seem to be able to graduate from that. Um, and I, my wife needed um, uh, some transportation to some of these party jobs, and I had a car. And so uh, I, I knew someone, I knew her, and she, uh, she I was, uh, I, I never. We met that way. I would, you know, took her to some of the work that she did, and then a uh, short time after that, we started dating. And um, some point after that, we moved in together and uh, into our first place uh, in the Greenwich Village, where we lived for several years. And uh, so that's kind of how that jumped mm-hmm. off. And then Boy. we moved here to the Hudson Valley 
um, uh, well, now it's 15 years, which is, uh, you know, we always thought we'd be New, New York, we'd be city people our whole lives, but yeah. it turns out. A couple uh, of talented people living together, boy, I'll tell you. Have you ever appeared in one of Bettina's movies? You know, uh, <laughs> I, I have. I think um, there's uh, there's one that she made years ago. I don't know if she talked about it. I forget what it's called. And I have a very, very small, unimpressive appearance. And then there's um, <laughs> a small video that uh, a friend of mine shot, came up here to work in uh, our friend Marla shot a, she's a singer, she shot a, a video in a um, in a local um, pool room here and uh, of a tune that she wrote. And Bettina was featured in it, and I had a small part in that. So it's not a movie, but it's a mini video. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, my face has popped up, and she's gotten me some work. I did background work as a musician on a, on a TV show, um, called Royal Pains. Oh, yes, ago. sure. Absolutely. Hey, that's and great. I, um, let me see if there's anything else. But yeah, there is a movie. I think it was Up All Night. I think that's the movie. You have to ask Patina that. I don't mm -hmm. remember it that well. All I remember is, uh, when my friend saw it, he said, wow, I'm watching this movie. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking to myself, what's Steve doing in here? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that was a critique of my acting. <laughs> he puts the top back on his wine bottle. Okay, I'm seeing Steve Rubin <laughs> yeah, <right>. now. <laughs> so. uh, because you know, when, when Matina was on, she actually, uh, we, we listened to a song when uh, she kind of scattered with you guys on, on a song. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Thanks for so, reminding me. Well, what happened is, um, uh, you know, you know, we... Tina and I support each other's work. We we go to as many performances as we can over the years. I've I've been to oh so many of her performances in theaters in, in Manhattan and small theaters up here. And she's come to so many of my of my gigs. It's just you know that's what you do. Mm -hmm. And um, um, she came down to one of our Beyond Jazz improv sessions, and uh, my friend Bob said at the moment, said, "Hey, why don't you?" Uh, do something in the microphone, you know, and we'll we'll play. And we just, you know, it's sort of like a like playtime for adults. Like we're playing around, right, and uh -huh. um, we recorded a little something, uh, and she was involved in it. So yeah, so she's, she was she's um, she was part of our session that day, briefly. It, it was cool. It was very cool. It was very cool. Yeah. You know, it's funny you said playtime for adults. My wife um, always used to ask me. She actually gave up on it now, but she used to ask me. You know, we've been married. We're going on 41 years now. And she, she wow. every once in a while, she'll ask me, you know, what are you going to be when you grow up? <laughs> I said, I don't know. I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, man. I well, you know, the, the other thing we've done with this Beyond Jazz, I forgot to mention, is we've, um, we've utilized this format to bring in other modalities of, uh, of performance uh, art and created multimedia events. For example... We did a uh, performance several years back, which I really loved, which was an artist, fine artist, painting on, on a very large canvas. And as she began to paint whatever she wanted to paint, we played music to complement it. And she continued to paint in response to the music we were creating. So it's a mutual improvisation wow. session. Wow, how cool so is that? Man. We did, we've done that with dancers. Um, we've done that with poets. And we did that uh, two years ago. We... Um, um, uh, we put together a, uh, a slideshow of images and we had the images projected on a large screen and we had, um, we, uh, invited folks to come in to listen to us, uh, create a, um, a soundtrack to the images that were putting, that were being presented Holy on the screen. Wow. And, what a great, cool idea. And that's something we, we, we really want to do more of. I'm, I'm a big believer in. And, and mixing um, different art forms together, I think it introduces mm -hmm. folks to stuff that they don't normally get involved with. And that's you know, so true. Yeah, of, wow. you know, we all do that. We're all in our world. You know, we're just into music. We're just into theater. We're just into dance. Whatever it is, we're into. And if you can find a way to pull them together in some sort of performance art, um, I think um, there's a lot of uh, potential there. So um, we're really looking. Um, uh, I don't have anything set yet but i'm definitely going to have something like that happen um this late spring and summer uh, on more than one occasion now steve should we go to um like for instance 
when you eventually have this event that we were just talking about late spring, early summer, how can we find out about that on your sure. Facebook well, page? Right tell now, us, yeah. um, okay. So right now, um, you know, there are two places to get information about music that I'm uh, involved with. If it, as the festival develops, which it really hasn't quite yet for this year, that information would be at the Hudson Valley jazzfest.org website right as relates to what i'm involved with with my my other friends at this improv project or just gigs that i do um um that information is best found by just following me on facebook uh, steve rubin you know and that's mm-hmm. because um um you know aside from my pictures of my of my wife and you know, my tofu dinner and my dog and my two cats. <laughs> Once you uh, can, you know, get you a, you know, can stomach that ridiculousness, <laughs> you'll also get some information about um, what's happening musically. And there's also a, a page called Warwick Hudson Valley Jazz where I talk about the festival. And uh, we try to, as much as possible, help promote other people's work as well. Uh, like, for example, I'm playing... Um, um, my, uh, a gig uh, down a road on May 22nd in the town of uh, Florida outside of a tavern called Mattingly's Tavern. I'm playing May 29th at a art gallery in Port Jervis called the Upfront Art Gallery. And uh, sooner than that, I think it's May 8th or 9th, I forget, but they can find out by going to Upfront Gallery's website. Um, some friends of mine, musicians, uh, our music trio, a jazz group, is playing there as well. So, you know, I try to, in a certain way, we, we try to promote one another uh, yeah, sure. you know, by going or, or, or mentioning it. And uh, and um, I have uh, other performances in different places, um, uh, different towns, and I'll put that information up as it comes up. Uh, I used to have a, a regular Sunday uh, monthly gig at a really great restaurant here in Warwick called the Iron Forge Inn, but with, you know, with COVID, obviously, um, th- that hasn't happened. Same um, plans, yeah. Maybe, maybe they'll bring that back, mm-hmm. you know, so um, we're in this pattern, a lot of musicians, certainly those of us that are not, you know, established artists, you know, in terms of having big followings and so forth, of waiting to see how... Um, these venues that had music as part of what they did, you know, how they, and if they reintegrated into what they're about. And it's really up to the public in a way to, um, uh, show the support. I shouldn't say, I, I shouldn't say it's up to them, but we, we would appreciate the help. I think is a better way to put it mm-hmm. of the public to inquire. I mean, if you, if you go to a, a restaurant or a cafe or someplace and you used to hear a jazz group or something, you know, you know, ask them if that's, if that's going to happen again. You know, we have to create the. We have to um, um, be part of um, sustaining the interest in, in yeah. live music. Uh, uh, we all have to um, be part of that. Very important uh, and well put. Yeah. yeah. Now, Steve, before we say goodbye, I'm going to ask you an impossible question, of course. Sure. <laughs> and now, actually, you know, after having spoken with you. Um, I originally was going to ask you, who are your top three jazz artists? But if you'd like to expand and just have your top three music artists, if you want to not limit it to jazz, because you you know, you know do have this wide circle of, of genres, who are your three top musical oh, artists? Oh, I, I really can't say. You, you know, can't, right? I know. It's, 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 it's almost like a mood thing. I mean, obvious... I mean, you know, if I named one jazz artists or one rock band or one soul artist, then it would seem like that um, that's the thing. And <laughs> let, let me say this. That, that, um, I, I share uh, the same affection and influence by the same sets of artists that many musicians are. You know, so, you know, if you grew up on rock and roll, then sure, you're influenced by the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and and, and Led Zeppelin and, and, and the Allman Brothers and, mm-hmm. and Johnny Winter and so forth. And um, if you listen to soul music, how could you not be influenced by Aretha Franklin and James Brown and, and um, Al Green? And, right. But that um, doesn't mean and, you don't uh, like Sam Cooke. I know. Yeah. Right. Sam, you're right. Um, uh, if, if you're listening to reggae, you know, you have to have heard Jimmy Cliff and Third World um, and, um, and, and, and other groups and, you know, 
of course, there's Miles Davis and Coltrane and Louis Armstrong and and Keith Jarrett and Elvin Jones and the, you know Weather Report and you know I mean on a given it, day you know I still listen to CDs in my car you know me I too reach into, I could reach into that little you know that little pocket you know on the side of the seat there and I, you know I might pull out you know um, uh, Beggar's Banquet and <laughs> I might pull out. Um, uh, Keith Jarrett, the Cone concerts, and I might pull out James Bob Brown live at the Apollo, and I might mm-hmm. pull out Joe Zawinul live. I mean, uh, you know, it depends on the mood I'm in, and I, or I might pull out, you know, some, you know, series of classical recordings that puts me in a frame of mind. Yeah, you, you know, it, it's uh, so. Um, I it's think, all in the mix. I you think know? your answer. Yeah, you know? I think your answer that you can't answer it. It's actually the perfect answer. It's all there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, do yeah. I mean, there, there are things that come up more often because you know you have a preference. I think we're all like that. I mean, I think you can be diverse in your interests and at the same time have favorites. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, I I I like a lot of different styles of food, but I I you know if you had to ask me if I if I was stuck. On a desert island, well, not a desert island. If I was stuck somewhere <laughs> and I get only one food, you know, if you want to, I'd probably say Italian food. Mm-hmm. You know, um, <laughs> you know, musicians like to do that thing, like you know, what are you, what are your ten, you know, stuck on a desert island albums that you must have in order to survive? You know, um, you, you know, mine would be a mix of stuff. Obviously, there'd be a bunch of jazz in there, but it'd be a bunch of other stuff in and, there too you know? and then next week you'd come up with 10 others that you say oh man why didn't i think of this one why didn't i think of this one and it depends right? how long i'm stuck there for i mean if i'm right. stuck there forever that's tricky if you're only stuck yeah. there for a year or two that's a different answer yeah. forever you got to go with a, a lot of double albums <laughs> <laughs> that's true you know and you, so there's that you know uh, but i you know i get i understand the question people always want to sort of you know, to me, the problem when, when folks answer that question is that when you don't really know who that person is, that answer sets up um, a rigid definition of who who they are. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's so true. And, and, yeah, that and is I so think true. A way to avoid that is not because you're trying to be coy. It's just that, you know. I don't know, you know, I might feel differently right now, and maybe <laughs> if you ask me a question tomorrow, I might, yeah. if I'm in a different kind of a mood, I mm-hmm. might come up with a different answer. Yeah, I, I, I'm a hypocrite by asking you that question, because I feel the yeah. same way you do, yeah. <laughs> honestly. Yeah. Well, listen, <clears throat> Steve, it has been a joy, a real, real joy to talk to you. I'm so glad that uh, that you were nice enough to come on. Um, hey, I appreciate you asking me. It's, it's very nice. I feel honored that anybody would be interested. So it's just it's great talking cool. with you. You know, I, I wanted to finish up with um, a number that you shared with me uh, called Green Dolphin Street. Oh, yeah. And as we take ourselves out of the uh, out of the interview here, what can you tell us about Green Dolphin Street? On Green Dolphin Street, um, gee, believe it or not, I, I you know, I'm Maybe it's, I don't know what it is, names fall out of my head. I'm forgetting the author. But um, it's become a, a, it's been a jazz standard for for a long time. And the great thing about this, I'll say about this, uh, um, not only this tune, many tunes, is that, you know, there's a whole body of material that lends itself to varied interpretation. And depending on the instrumentation, the the musicians, the style, the mood, you can kind of you play it differently. You can play it a dozen times, and maybe you can throw a different dozen kind of different you know takes on it, different mm-hmm. feel. And I, I, I guess, and I like this tune. I always have. There are some players get tired of playing it because it comes up a lot. I like it because it's it's a fun tune to play as a musician, and I it's it's a nice melody that folks who aren't hardcore jazz fans find easy to take in. Mm-hmm. Sometimes um, folks. Th- think that jazz is too abstract and esoteric and you, you need to be some sort of scientist to listen to it. And of course you don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, um, you know, ha- having being familiar with melodies helps um, and certainly playing material that either is a familiar melody or presents a melody that's sort of easy to take in and easily um, uh, that's memorable um, um, 
um, is uh, is a good way to turn people on to it. So for that reason, I like playing the tune. I think that it's um, it's um, it's a successful tune to play for the general audience in, 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 in mm-hmm. diff- uh, when you have what's, what I would call a general listening mm-hmm. audience. Miles um, Davis. Is it Miles uh, Davis? He's done it. No, he didn't, he didn't write it. Okay, but he's okay. Done it. That's where I've heard it. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you, you Google, you know, uh, versions of um, Green Dolphin Street and you're going to find, you know, Mm-hmm. hundreds and hundreds of them so i'll the, find yeah, it the thing is um, i'll find it we'll just, put it on the screen <laughs> yeah I, I i i was thrilled to play this because i was lucky enough to be playing with these great players uh, uh john arbo on bass and joe trantino on on uh, on keyboards and rick savage on trumpet i don't remember who's on horn on this one I, it's, it's either harvey kaiser or or, or or bob rosen um and so uh w- I, I feel uh, that I've been really fortunate because I've been able to uh, pull together gigs and have uh, musicians work with me who's, who's playing is, uh, is above mine. And they've, uh, you know, they've, they, I've had the honor of having what I do rise up because of their, uh, what, what they bring to the, uh, to the gig. So it, it was a thrill for me to, to play with these great players. Uh, it really is. So, Let's listen to On Green Dolphin Street. And once again, Steve Rubin, you you were great. We'd love to have you on the show. Oh, thanks, and, man. Well, anytime. I, I was going to say, it. would you come back sometime? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Super. I'd get back in touch near the summer when we when we know where we really stand with the jazz festival. That I'd would be perfect. About that. We'll do that around July, right? Because then Oh, that's be... beautiful, man. Good. That's great. Okay, Steve. Thank you so much. Great talking thank to you. Thank you, Steve. I hope we meet one of these days. I uh, appreciate it. Yes, that would be great. It's a, it's a great thing that you do here. Oh, thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you, Steve. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. 
And now, folks, it's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.